Good morning. Welcome to this Eastertide Lions Forum. Let us open with a prayer, the collect for this second Sunday of Easter. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal Mystery establish the new covenant of reconciliation. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Over the next five Sundays uh, in the Lions Forum, we shall be exploring the theme, the victory of Easter, proclaimed in scripture, liturgy, art, poetry, and music. <clears throat> this Sunday, we begin with the proclamation of the resurrection in the New Testament, in the Holy Scriptures. In his book, Miracles, the Christian apologist C.S. Lewis reminds us of the centrality of the proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Gospels and in the preaching of the early church. Lewis writes this, in the earliest days of Christianity, an apostle was first and foremost a man who claimed to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. Only a few days after the crucifixion, when two candidates were nominated for the vacancy created by the treachery of Judas, their qualification was that they had known Jesus, that they had known him personally both before and after his death, and could offer first-hand evidence of the resurrection in addressing the outer world. The resurrection is the central theme in every Christian sermon reported in the book of Acts. The resurrection and its consequences were the gospel, or good news which the Christians brought. What we call the Gospels, the narratives of our Lord's life and death, were composed later for the benefit of those who had already heard and accepted the Gospel. They were in no sense the basis of Christianity. They were written for those already converted the miracle of the resurrection and the theology of the miracle comes first. The biography comes later as a comment on it. When modern writers talk of the resurrection, they usually mean one particular moment, the discovery of the empty tomb and the appearance of Jesus just a few yards away from it. This story of that moment is what Christian apologists now chiefly try to support and skeptics try to impugn. But this almost exclusive concentration on the first five minutes or so of the resurrection would have astonished the earliest Christian teachers in claiming to have seen the resurrection, they were not necessarily claiming to have seen that. Some of them had, some of them had not. It had no more importance than any of the other appearances of the risen Jesus, apart from the poetic and dramatic importance which the beginning of things must always have. What they were claiming was that they had all, at one time or another, met Jesus during the six or seven weeks that followed his death. Sometimes they seemed to have been alone 
when they did so. But on one occasion, 12 of them saw him together. And on another occasion, about 500 of them. St. Paul says that the majority of the 500 were still alive when he wrote the first letter to the Corinthians. In other words, in about Anno Domini 55. Thus saith C.S. Lewis. The New Testament records some 10 appearances of Jesus to his disciples in his resurrected body. One of these 10 appearances that is most deeply fixed in my imagination is the appearance to the two forlorn disciples on the road to Emmaus later on that first Easter day. As the story goes, in the story of the Lord's appearance to Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus, as told in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35, we see Luke's skill as a narrator in a way that is not to be surpassed in all of the New Testament. The appearance to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus is already at some distance from the appearance in the garden to Mary Magdalene, just a few yards from the tomb. As the post-resurrection appearances unfold in the Gospels, they occur further and further away from the tomb, perhaps convincing the disciples that the risen Lord can be and is present with them wherever they are. There are two special points we might take from the on the road to Emmaus appearance as Luke tells it. Firstly, it was from the scriptures, in other words, the Old Testament, that Jesus explained to Cleopas and his companion the meaning of his death. As can be seen clearly in the book of Acts, after the resurrection, the disciples read the Old Testament with new eyes and saw in it all that had happened to Jesus as the fulfillment of a plan of God that had forward since the creation of the world. And secondly, in this beautiful story, it was in the breaking of the bread at eventide when Jesus agreed to abide with the two that he was also made known to them. This same experience has been witnessed to in innumerable times in the history of the church and in our own lives as well. In the breaking of bread at the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, more than anywhere else, Christians have known and felt that the risen Lord was with them. That's perhaps, as an aside, part of the reason today we yearn more than ever for the resumption of our Sundays together, physically together, once again, in this church, surrounding this altar, receiving Holy Communion together. So far in this Lions Forum, I've tried to draw your attention primarily to the emphasis on the witness to the resurrection in the four Gospels and in the book of Acts. Now, I'd like to turn your attention to the letters of St. Paul, and in particular, to chapter 15 of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But as an introduction to Paul's uh, lengthy and profound discussion of the resurrection in that chapter, I draw your attention first to two statements in the Nicene Creed that we say every Sunday at the Eucharist. 
there are three stanzas in the Nicene Creed. In the second stanza of the Creed, we profess our belief in one Lord, Jesus Christ, who, and here is the phrase I draw to your attention, who on the third day rose again in accordance with the scriptures. And then in the final or third stanza, we profess further that we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. The second of those two phrases in the creed, we look for the resurrection of the dead, is taken directly from St. Paul, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. In chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul argues directly from the resurrection of Christ to our own destiny. Christianity does not teach the natural immortality of the soul. That was a Greek idea. Christianity teaches that God can as well raise us up as he raised Christ from the dead. This is the meaning of that phrase, the resurrection of the body. Not that our physical bodies will be resuscitated like resuscitating a corpse, but that we shall be raised as complete persons, capable of communion with God and with one another in God's kingdom. In other words, there will be a kind of transformed continuity of identity for each of us. The New Testament commentator, William Barclay, so accessible to Christian laymen and women and clergy alike, puts the argument about the resurrection of the body in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians very well. He reminds us that Corinth was a wealthy city, that it was the doorway to Greece in his day. And so Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth knowing how deeply the formation of their minds owed to Greek thought, to help them distinguish between the Greek doctrine of the immortality of the soul, a kind of ghostly disembodied existence, and the radical good news of our destiny in Christ. What Paul pleads for us in writing to the Corinthians is that man is saved both in body and soul. And as William Barclay writes, after death, you will still be you, and I will still be I. The individual will remain. The resurrection body will be no more like this body than the golden waving corn is like the shriveled seed from which it came, or the daffodil from the bulb. Barclay concludes by claiming that Paul used that term, the resurrection of the body, because the Greeks had at that time no concept of what we call personality. And so Barclay writes, we'd be better saying I believe in the survival of personality and just leave the matter of in what body to the wisdom of God. What is the result or fruit of placing one's faith in the transformed continuity of our life or personality here and in the world to come? Most importantly, it challenges and transforms our understanding of the finality of death. In that chapter, chapter 15, verse 26, St. Paul says, the last enemy to be conquered is death. When Jesus appeared to all of his disciples, it was 
to the marks of his dying wounds that he drew attention. When he ate supper at Emmaus with the two, on the evening of that first Easter day, it was by the symbols of his death, the bread broken, the wine outpoured, that he disclosed himself to his two friends. As one Christian writer has put the matter, Easter does not cancel Good Friday, it interprets it, transforms it. For all of us, Easter this year has been marked by a more than usual meditation on our mortality and the mortality of others. I will let Father Murray talk further on that subject when he addresses the topic the victory of the resurrection and the liturgy, in which I think he helps, he will help you see that the burial office, for all of its solemnity, and so surrounded rightly with grief, is yet an extension of the liturgy of Easter. But as for now, in the here and now, Paul reminds that what we place our hope in as pertaining to our destiny, it has a great bearing also on our present life. So Paul ends chapter 15 by saying, If you have all that glory to look forward to, then keep, keep yourself steadfast in God's faith and service. Paul is encouraging us to see that if we have the eternal perspective, we can come back to be patient, humble, encouraged in our daily work, even in this period of isolation and social distancing, and to glorify God in every single thing that we are given to do. As a final word, to bring the Word of God and Scripture into our daily life and experience, I would suggest we see that while we view the death and resurrection of Christ as part of the reality of history, we should see it also as very much part of our present daily Christian reality. Antony Bloom, the great Russian Orthodox theologian and spiritual writer gives us these words of joy and promise. He says, We can know the Lord day after day as the apostles knew him. Not the Christ of the flesh, not Christ as he was seen in bewilderment by people who surrounded him in the days of his earthly life, but the ever-living Christ, the Christ of the Spirit of whom St. Paul speaks, the risen Christ who belongs to time and eternity because he died once for all upon the cross, but lives, but lives forever and ever. May the Lord continue to bless all of us this Easter time. Amen.